Find your Bible this morning, open it to the book of James, chapter 1. It's going to be our preaching text. You know, we've been doing a series from chapter 1 uh, on the theme of authentic faith. And so we continue that and wrap it up today on this four-part series. You know, I think all of us are the same. We want something that's authentic. We want something genuine. We want something that's real. We don't want a cheap knockoff or something that looks authentic. We want genuine leather. We don't want pleather. We want the real deal. And I think that's uh, with all of us. A few years ago, Mary went uh, on a mission trip to China with a group of ladies and uh, had a wonderful time, I know, with this women of influence who went. Uh, but she was going to mainland China, so I told her, I said, hey, hon, I know there's going to be opportunity for you to get me a Rolex watch if you'll just <laughs> find <laughs> If you'll just look for a street vendor, I'm sure that you can find one. So I gave her a $10 bill and told her to bring me back the change after she had bought my watch. Well, believe it or not, she accomplished the mission. Uh, and I, honest to God, I'm not exaggerating. I bet I didn't wear that watch over 15 minutes and the thing wasn't keeping time well. And I wound it again and shook it a bunch and, and much to my chagrin, I said, honey, you're going to have to take this thing back. <laughs> I said, I hope you got the name of that street vendor, but uh, you know, you got to keep looking, and maybe we can get some of the some of our money back. And so, anyhow, obviously, I got. Uh, I don't, and I actually don't think it said Rolex. I think it said Bolex, but it was close. <laughs> so anyhow, we blew the ten dollars and went on with life. I knew I wasn't getting any uh, thing, uh, something authentic, but I was hoping it would last a little longer than fifteen minutes. <laughs> So we want something that's real. We want something that's significant. And evaluating the authenticity of our own faith is really what chapter 1 is about here in the book of James. God wants no pretenders. He wants to, be, to have our, our heart and, and not to have a, a hypocritic uh, attitude and spirit. And, and so uh, and James chapter 1 really unpacks all of that truth. And we've seen it as, as he begins to talk about uh, one way we can tell if we're authentic, have authentic faith, is how we respond to trials and and how we resist temptations. And and then uh, Sunday a week ago we talked about real religion being how we respond to the Word of God and we're to be quick to hear it, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And how we're to con- today, especially, he's talking about how we the words that we use. And so the sermon title is the evaluation of the words we speak. Do the words we speak, the, 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 does does our tongue tell on us? You know, you ever go to the doctor and not feeling well and uh, they, they, they look at you and they, they, they grab a tongue depressor and say, stick out your tongue and they put that tongue depressor on there and say, ah, oh, you know, and they can evaluate physically how you're doing by looking at your tongue. And, and really that's what James chapter 1 is about. He says, look, an evaluation of your faith can be seen in, in your tongue, the words you use and and your spiritual health can be determined by, by, by your, your speech as well. And so we're going to make an evaluation today of the words we speak because they give us indication if our heart's right with God. So please stand once again, honor reading God's Word. Just a couple of verses today. We're going to unpack a lot of truths from this, but you follow along. There's an uh, outline in the worship bulletin. I, I pray it will be a benefit as you contemplate and consider what God's Word has to say today. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and keep one unspotted from the world. Father, we pray today that we can be honest in our evaluation, the words we use, and the words in our speech would would indeed give a indication that we belong to you. Help us to be people who control our language and our tongue. Help us to speak words that are edifying and kind, that build others up, that glorify you. And so, Lord, I pray that in today and speak to our hearts as we look at your word and we begin to unpack it and evaluate it today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You read the epistle of James, you'll see that uh, he really has more to say than any other biblical writer about the speech we use. And 
Uh, and, and, and actually, in all five chapters of the book of James, he addresses proper use of the tongue. In chapter one, he says it's relative to authentic faith and uh, that, that it must be a, a significant problem that needed to be addressed in the early church if he's going to use every five chapters of this epistle that he wrote and had something to say about controlling the tongue. So what was it? Uh, you know, we can only speculate what the issue might have been in the early church, but we'll assume it surely was some uh, bit of unruly speech, maybe caustic words, maybe gossip, maybe murmuring. Uh, these, are, these are things that uh, have, have been a problem in the church throughout the years. I would dare say there, I, I, as much as anything that has destroyed the local church, it's probably relative to things that have been said about other people. And here he's saying, look, our, our faith can be futile if we're not living in such a way that gives indication that we belong to the Lord. And so he says, look, words can be an, indi an indictment against you. Your faith is going to be vain. It's going to be futile. It's going to be useless. That's the word he uses there, that word worthless. All of these things are to communicate that our, our, our tongue, if it isn't guarded, the rest of our religion can be for naught. And the tongue can become a barometer of our spiritual health. And so in a sense, we're going to the doctor. We're going to the great physician who tells us, stick out your tongue and let's see how your spiritual health really is. So let me talk first about the potential of our words, the potential of our words. The tongue has been called the most powerful muscle in the Bible. In James in chapter 2 says, indeed, words can direct our lives or they can destroy our lives. And he uses that analogy, the directing power of a rudder on a huge ship and how it, it can navigate a ship by, by turning that rudder. And then he says they can, it can destroy our lives. And he used the analogy of a forest fire and, 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 and how indeed words can indeed be fiery. And so he says we better guard our tongue. Here in chapter 1, he says it's about authentic faith, how we either validate it or we bring it into question. So let me first say words can be effective. Under A, it, they can be effective. Words are the vehicle of our commu <coughs> communication. Proverbs 25, 11 says, words fitly spoken are like apples of gold on settings of silver. Proverbs 10, 21, the lips of the righteous feed many. Good news strengthens the bone. It was said of Jesus, those who heard him, they were astonished by the words he used and the answers that he had. So his deity was validated, not only in his miracles, not only in the resurrection, but seemingly the words that he taught as well. They became life to the hearers. Listen, effective communication is quite an asset. It's true in the workplace. It's true in our marriages. It's true in our witnessing. And it's true in virtually all of life. You ever laugh visiting with someone and say, what in the world were they talking about? Well, James says in, in chapter 3 about those who aspire to be teachers. He said they're going to be judged in a greater capacity. They're going to be judged more strictly. Why? Because our words are supercharged with potential either for good or for evil, for truth or for error. It was George Bernard Shaw who said, one, the hope and the sole hope of human humanity and his salvation lies in teaching. It does. Sometimes it's in the classroom, but it's always in the church. Listen, there's great potential for our words. They can be effective, they can be eternal, and they're, they will be memorable as well. You know, the two greatest speeches of the 20th century I read recently, one was Martin Luther King's speech, which would have been on August 28th of 1963. Many of us remember as he gathered at a mall in Washington, D.C., and there he shared his dream. I have a dream. And what was his dream? That people would no longer be judged by the color of their skin, but instead the content of their character. And then that great speech that John Fitzgerald Kennedy made, his inaugural address, January 20th, 1961, when he says, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That's a novel idea, isn't it? Those words were effective. They were enduring. They were compelling words. Our words can be effective. Secondly, they can be edifying. Listen to transformed heart. 
should produce language that is edifying, that is gracious, that's kind, that's inspiring. To be edifying, we're talking about building people up, exhorting them, promoting love and hope and certainly faith. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you might know how to answer every man. So our speech, our speech should first be gracious. We know what that means, to be gracious, to have an unmerited favor in the speech that we use. And then he says it ought to be seasoned with salt. We know a few things about salt. It adds flavor to virtually everything, to the blandness of foods. We put salt on our food, and it helps the food taste better, maybe with the exception of hospital food. <laughs> Nothing can help the food that you get given to you at the hospital. Well, one, they don't give you salt. They give you salt substitute or something that doesn't quite taste the same. I know that too, too well. But our speech, in other words, should be in good taste. Listen, is there anything more tasteless and disgusting to hear people rattling off cursing, using the Lord's name in vain, using insulting words or foul language? God help us to make our, our speech tasteful and true and treasured by others. Something else about salt, it was used as a preservative, as you know. And our words should be that as well. It should build others up to encourage and compel them to help people along their way to preserve and sustain relationships. We do this, this with the words that we use. And then in the first century, salt was also used at the time of this writing in Colossians as a healing agent. It was medicinal. It was used in an ointment for lacerations. We've all heard it said about something putting salt in the wound. And how salt, if you get on a cut, man, it, it stings. But the problem is not only the, the problem is the, the good side of the problem, I guess, that this is a healing agent as well. And, and it was used as salve for, uh, for those who, who, who needed something to heal their wound. And certainly our words should be complimentary and kind. It was Martin, uh, Mark Twain who said, I can live two months on one compliment. And how true it is. Somebody says a good word to us and, and it resonates with us and compels us. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There's one who speaks harshly like a piercing sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I remember hearing the story about John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. As he was walking along the streets, and of course this would have been in the 17th century, a long time ago, but he heard a conversation between two ladies and they were actually talking about the goodness and the grace of, of, of God. And, and it caught his attention as he walked home. These, these words that, they, that he heard used by these ladies brought conviction. And he got home and he said he got on his knees and asked the God that these ladies were talking about, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into his heart and to save him and to set him apart that he might live as they were living. They had the words that we see have great potential. But secondly, there's a problem with words as well. There's a problem with words. So we can quickly assume for James to address this problem of the tongue in every chapter of this book, there must have been some prevailing problems in the church. So while our words can be positive and edifying and encouraging, and uh, as we just looked, they can be perilous as well. They can even be lethal. Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a lady who was in despair who took her own life. And, and all she wrote in that suicide note that she left was this. They said, they said. She never even concluded the sentence, but whatever they must have said was enough for her to take her own life. Painful enough, she couldn't go on. We can't underestimate the power of words. You know, I'm told in Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, for every word that he penned, 125 people died from 1938 to 1945. No wonder Solomon wrote in Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Let me quickly touch on three problematic areas of words. The first one is excessive words. This is a preacher saying, 
There may, be, there may be a problem with preaching too long. Let's be honest. Some people talk too much. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Guess what? I, Mary and I have been cleaning up uh, our basement. We've had stuff stored down there and the many moves that we've made and finally made a decision to get rid of some things. Well, I tripped onto my second grade report card. <laughs> 1958. I was in the second grade. Jewel Little was my teacher. Got my grades over here, which were good. And then remarks by the teacher. And then she had written my name in crayon on here, so I guess we had no pencils back in the day. But I, I'm just curious here what she had to say about me. Follows directions well. He's a good listener. Cooperates well with the group. Works and plays well with the group. Works independently. Is neat about his work. And then the last thing, he talks too much. <laughs> I was on a good roll there, but she, she couldn't quit without saying, Steve just talks too much. Well, I guess it's kind of unique that God would call me to preach. What can I say? You know, it says in Ecclesiastes 5.2, don't be rash with your mouth and let your heart not utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Proverbs 14, endless talk leads one to poverty. Proverbs 17, an intelligent person restrains his words. Here's what I know. Man, I've never been embarrassed by words I didn't use or didn't say. I've used this Will Rogers quote that, that says, it's funny as heck. He says, uh, never use a good opportunity to shut up. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 19 when there are many words, sin is unavoidable. Excessive words can often get us in trouble. Secondly, is uh, I, I, I want to use this as an example as well. When words are erratic, is what I'm calling it, means when words are odd or outlandish, peculiar or strange. Uh, you ever engage in a conversation and you kind of walk away saying, what were they talking about? I'm not sure exactly what they were saying. They were either lacking communication skills, they got distracted, maybe overly emotional. And maybe you've done this. Maybe you've walked away and said, well, why in the world did I say that? Listen, we can say what we think, but we need to first think what we're going to say. Now, this is commonplace on Twitter especially, Somebody tweets something and maybe they do it because they're overly emotional about something and their, their remark is outlandish or accusatory or inaccurate and then pretty soon that tweet disappears. You know, the difference is in words, there's no delete button once we've said them. <laughs> Reminds me of a young lady I met not that long ago and she appeared to be pregnant. I knew better but it had come out of my mouth before I thought about it when I said, so when are you due? I was relieved when she said, next month. I said, well, praise the Lord, I'll never do that again. Don't ever do that, guys. It's not a wise thing. Things could have gone south with that, but praise God it didn't. Proverbs 15, 28, the mind of a righteous person thinks before answering, but the mouth of the wicked blurts out evil things, which brings me to see words can be excessive, sometimes erratic. Thirdly, they can be evil as well. Words are powerful enough to ruin a re person's reputation with slander, with malicious talk. And these words sometimes take a life of their own. You know, the Bible has much to say about gossip and murmuring. You know what it has to say about it? Don't do it. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 6, whoever speaks slander is a fool. Proverbs 17, 9, a wicked person listens to malicious talk. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. Whoever conceals an offense, do you know what he does? He promotes love. But whoever gossips about it separates friends. That's what the Bible says. Listen, gossip's been condemned all the way back to the time of Moses. When the people, as he led them to be delivered from Egyptian bondage, taking them to the promised land, they murmured against Moses and, and spoke lies about his intent and his leadership. They cursed him and they wanted to go back to Egypt, as you remember. And then when the Apostle Paul would write in the, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
He says we're to learn from the example of Israel's past mistakes. And then he brings to light a few things that happened in the Sinai Desert. He mentions three major sins that we should learn from their examples. Number one, sexual immorality. As God would kill 23,000, they were to be destroyed because they had sexual, had sexual sin with the Moabite women, these prostitutes, and worship to the Baal god of Peor. And then he says... We're to learn from their idolatry. They worship pagan gods. And, 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 and we immediately think of the golden calf that was erected when Moses would be on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments. And then you know what he th- said on the third sin was? He said it was murmuring, complaining, gossiping. And it puts it up right up there on the same plane as idolatry and sexual immorality. So God puts gossiping in condemnation as strong as he did sexual immorality and idolatry. I know this has happened to you. It's happened to me. You ever have anyone say anything about you that was untrue? They say a half-truth, and it spreads like wildfire. You know what I, I often say? A lie can spread halfway around the world before truth can put its boots on, and it's just that way. There's a problem with words, sometimes excessive words, sometimes erratic words, and sometimes evil words. But finally, I conclude with this, Roman numeral three, not only the potential and the problem, the predictability of our words, the predictability. James is saying there's a diagnostic tool of authentic faith. And then he begins to write this chapter. It's how we react uh, to, to the trials of life, how we resist temptations, how we respond to the truth of the word of God. But he also says it's relative to how we use our words. They either validate our faith because these words under A are diagnostic. They're diagnostic. Many of us are familiar with the diagnostic tools in the medical field. We know about PET scans, we know about MRIs, we know about blood work, we know about a heart cath, or I know plenty about those. But real religion has some diagnostic tools as well. And it's not merely internal, there's some external things as well. And we confirm our faith by not simply what we do externally, I mean, we can join join a church, we can sign a creed, we can go through catechism, but he's saying it's more than just what you do externally, it's what your life is about, what you do. That's the diagnostic tool for real religion. And his whole book is about faith in shoe leather. It's, It's caring for the needy, as he says here, propping up the weary, caring for widows and orphans. It's relative to using your tongue as well. It tells on you. Many of us will remember a song Hank Williams sang in the early 50s. Your cheating heart will tell on you. You know what Jesus said? Your heart will tell on you. In Matthew 12, 34, he said, From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 15, 18, But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and that's what makes a person unclean. In other words, we can correct our language. We can even improve our impulsive responses. However, the problem really is a problem of the heart. It's not surprising. Proverbs 4.23 says you've got to guard your heart with all diligence for out of it come the issues of life. So critical words condemn a critical heart. Self-centered words are usually found in a selfish heart. Profane words come from a profane heart. Impatient words come from an impatient heart. Conversely, loving words come from a loving heart. Sympathetic words come from a sympathetic heart. Sincere words from a sincere heart and forgiving words from a forgiving heart. And while your cheating heart may tell on you, so will a transformed heart. It will tell on you as well. It's a diagnostic truth, our words were, but secondly, they're decisive as well. Not only diagnostic, but decisive. 
when you and I make a decision, it's done in our heart, our minds, our conscience, and our convictions. And these decisions, if they are sincere, they will manifest themselves in our behavior. And James says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And when it comes to faith in Christ, because we realize we have a need for Christ, we're spiritually lost, sinners in need of a Savior, we can't allow it to remain simply internal. Because here's what Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Paul would write in Romans chapter 10, if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, for with the heart man believes into righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And to salvation and word relate to the world what we believe and deem important. It motivates us. And it tells where we're headed. We call the words that we communicate. It should reflect our faith. It's our testimony because it communicates the divine decision that we've made in our heart, our life, and in Christ Jesus. We've sang this invitation countless times. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. But what authenticates it all is transformation, changed by the grace of God, and that makes it authentic. So let's say today with the psalmist, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord God. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. The predictability of words, they tell on us. They diagnose the soul. And they can be decisive words that set us on the right path or the wrong path. Let's pray that God would help us to allow us to have authentic faith. Oh, yes, that's evaluated in the trials we have of life and how we respond to those, how we resist temptation, how we uh, listen to the word of God and act on the word of God, but also how we keep our tongue in check and how we use words that would bring glory to our Savior. Would you bow your heads with me today? We can make an evaluation of the words we use. They tell on us. And I pray today that we would understand in a new way that they can be problematic, but they have great potential as well. And we should be consistent to use words that glorify our Savior and bring honor to Him. Just a moment, we're going to sing an invitation hymn, one that's familiar, one that I love. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. What a beautiful picture of the love of God who softly and tenderly calls us unto himself by his grace and by his mercy. Well, I'm telling you today, if you've never given your heart to Christ, could I suggest today, today may be your day of divine appointment where you can come and turn from a life of sin and accept the grace and the goodness of God through belief in Jesus Christ. He's not the best way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. And he'll give out the grace sufficient for your sins. Today, I encourage you to come and confess Christ. You may be here today and desire to be a part of our church. We'd love for you to come be a part of the fellowship today. We invite you to come as well. You may be here today and in need of some prayer, something bothering you, something that's consuming you, and you need someone to pray with you. We encourage you to come. It'll be our joy to pray for you as well. Father, this is your invitation. We can give the outward appeal, but only you can transform a heart. Only you can make a difference in a life. So we're dependent on you, Holy Spirit. Do your great work as we sing this song of invitation softly and tenderly knowing that you're calling in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's